welcome to the Transformative Play Initiative's Indie Tabletop Role-Playing Games Design Basics. Um, this is a second part of a two-part series on tabletop role-playing game design. So I do encourage you to watch the first video as well to give context to a lot of the things that we're gonna talk about here. So the agenda for our lecture, um, we're gonna go over Indie Tabletop Role-Playing Games. Uh, the indie discourse communities, such as the Forge and Story Games, uh, Game Design in the Game Fiasco by Jason Morningstar, Mechanics in Fiasco, Fiasco and the ways that it subverts traditional role-playing games, Game Design and Mechanics in Apocalypse World, um, and then we're going to transition to talk a little bit about indie tabletop uh, RPGs and crowdfunding, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, how indie RPG scenes have evolved today. Uh, and then we'll have some takeaways. So obviously this is a lot to cover and we're only gonna be doing very, very broad strokes. There are thousands of indie RPGs that are all quite unique, um, but we've chosen Fiasco and Apocalypse World because those are two of the ones that have um, spurred a lot of creativity from a lot of people. And a lot of new games have been created as a result of these two games. Okay, so indie tabletop role playing games. Um, there are some example communities that I have here. Um, Rec.games.frp.advocacy was a news group in the 1990s uh, where people would go to chat about game design. Uh, there was then The Forge, uh, the story game Diaspora. There's also Big Bad Con, Metatopia, Ropacon, Festival and uh, games on demand at conventions like PAX Unplugged, Dreamation, and Origins. So these are some of the places where people would find each other if they were interested in different kinds of games uh, other than traditional tabletop RPGs, and also where they could go and play those kinds of games uh, or discuss them. So indie tabletop role-playing games vary widely in terms of their themes and their structure, but they often contain stripped down mechanics uh, so unlike uh, what we talked about in the earlier video about Dungeons and Dragons and Vampire, very elaborate rule sets, uh, instead in indie tabletop role-playing games, they often focus on telling an interesting story rather than the characters winning. Um, and this is sometimes called story games, as we will see. Uh, there is a strong distribution of creative agency, which allows many players to have ownership of the narrative world and the characters within it not just the game master, who traditionally has been the person that is responsible for the world as a whole. In some cases, they may even be GM-less, meaning that there is no one person steering the narrative ship. Uh, indie tabletop role-playing games are split into two major categories. So we have indie RPGs. Um, these generally have one or a few individual creators. Um, they sometimes release their games for free, sometimes for maybe a small amount of money. And then there's small press RPGs, which um, are small companies um, similar to Wizards of the Coast or White Wolf, but with much fewer employees and probably much fewer products as well. So role-playing game design, the Forge, story games, and the indie turn, as we will call it. So discourse communities have thrived since the very early days of Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, in those days, they had zines um, that, were, that were popular, and these were things that you would receive in the mail that would have articles to each other. Um, and there's a lot of debate going on even way back then. It's a lot of the same debates as what we're having today. Um, but of course, as the advent of the internet happened, more and more people could take part in these, these debates, and they often occurred in online forums. So in the 1990s, we had these things called, um, uh, these discussion forums called uh, bulletin boards. Um, uh, and we would debate role-playing game design theory on bulletin boards or on news groups. So in the one that was really popular uh, for indie tabletop designers was rec.games.frp, meaning fantasy role-playing dot advocacy. And they, this, this group of theorists came up with this concept of creative agendas. Um, and these creative agendas were of special interest in these discussions because they were looking at the motivations and the proclivities that players had towards certain types of play. 
as well as the types of design that were conducive to certain creative agendas. So John Kim first published a summary of this discourse in 1997, and he established three terms. The first was dramatism. These are players who focus on creating a satisfying story. Then there's gamism. These are players who focus on tactics, mechanics, and other forms of problem solving. So gamism in this case often means thinking um, maybe outside of the character and thinking about the game as a whole in terms of decision making. And then there's this term called simulationism, uh, players who resolve in-game events based solely on game world considerations, meaning that they emphasize faithfully simulating the world and faithfully simulating their character. Now there's other terms that evolve in LARP um, that we won't get into in this video, but these three uh, form, form the core of what will be role-playing game theory uh, moving forward, at least in this scene. So then Ron Edwards, who's part of this community, created a, an online forum called The Forge. And he fleshed out these theories into what he called stances. And he renamed dramatism to narrativism. So that's often what you hear today rather than dramatism. And this established then what he would call GNS theory. So gamism, narrativism, and simulationism. And so you may hear people offhandedly talking about GNS. That's what they're referring to. So this new forum, The Forge, um, members were invited to post accounts of their actual play experience, as it was called. So these are written explanations and observations of their in-game experiences. Now, this is unique because um, before we had people streaming their entire play sessions, people often didn't want to watch other people role play, nor did they really want to analyze someone else's um, game experience per se. Uh, and, and I'm speaking generally here, of course, there were small communities that would do this, but this is actually creating a culture where it's normal to play a game and then write it up and then put it offered up as a, as a, um, a form of reflection and analysis to a group. So other members were invited to analyze these play sessions with a special emphasis on implying this GNS theory. So there, for several years, that was the main focus of, of the Forge, although there were plenty of other conversations that were going on uh, that went to different directions. So of particular interest were game sessions that were quote unquote unsatisfying. And forum members would try to discern the answers to questions like, is this game's design suited for narrativism, gamism, or simulationism. In other words, does it have a coherent creative agenda towards one of these styles of play? And also, what are the preferences of the players and of the game master, which may be different, in terms of their creative agendas? Um, and so traditional role-playing games like Dungeons and Dragons and Vampire were especially critiqued in terms of their stated creative agendas and the actual play at the table. Uh, Vampire in particular uh, calls itself a personal horror storytelling game, which implies a narrativist approach. But then there's this massive rule book with mechanics for winning, which implies a gamist approach. And that leads to clashes and expectations in play styles. Now this is common in a lot of role-playing games, especially commercial role-playing games, because they're trying to appeal to as many different players as possible. So some people are really gonna love to read a lot of lore and backstory and get into the, the narrative and others are gonna be more interested in what their character can do. Um, but in order, by spreading themselves so thin, by, by having all of these different range of things, people from this community felt that that wasn't a coherent uh, game design. And, and because of that, people in their play sessions would often have conflicts um, or would feel like a game session is unsatisfying because they were actually have different ideas of what a game actually quote unquote is even. Um, and this was my experience when I first started studying role-playing games uh, when I was in college. Um, I interviewed people in my D&D group uh, for a paper and I found that they were having vastly different experiences of the same game than I was. Um, and their motivations for play were very different. Um, and so this is one of the things that interested me about role playing uh, from the beginning, because it, it basically showed how 
psychologically, we work differently and it, it revealed those things. Uh, we were getting different needs met by the same experience. And perhaps some people weren't getting their needs met at all. Um, and that's one of the reasons that forms like the forge existed. So there was this uh, discourse around crunch versus fluff, meaning that um, this will determine how participants prioritize play. So, you know, again, some people will look at the quote unquote fluff of the book, like the, the song lyrics that are included in Vampire and the descriptions of different narrative events, you know, that is evocative for particular stories that they might form. And then other people just skip straight to the mechanics and are focusing on that, which is the, the, the crunch versus the fluff. And um, because of that, again, sometimes you can have conflicts in the um, creative agendas at the table. So debates ensued and continued over the course of the 2000s and, and the early 2010s on the forge. Um, and if you want to learn more about the forge, uh, Bill White has done extensive research and has a book about all of these uh, different, different phases of the forge. These discussions often led members to actually create their own indie games. So frustrated by existing games, they would create their own. They would photocopy them and they would distribute them at conventions to other members of this community, often for free. So they would create a booth and people who were in the know would go and ask for these special games. Um, and members would uh, explain their design choices when they created the game uh, and post their actual play experiences of these new games. And other players would post their experiences as well. And some created small press companies to print their games. And this includes Lumpley Games, Black and Green Games, and Bully Pulpit. And we'll be talking about two games, uh, one from uh, Lumpley Games and one from Bully Pulpit next. So out of this, a vibrant design community emerged where there was a lot of um, reinforcement of experimentation. And that continues to this day. Uh, members generally favored a narrativist or a story-based approach. Uh, so prioritizing story above all else. And we'll see that as uh, designers start making choices in the games to follow. However, a lot of them often reject GNS theory altogether, um, which is interesting. But um, this narrativist or story-based approach came to be known as story games. And that's a very broad description that a lot of games fall under. In story games, uh, the game settings, the mechanics, and the communities are focused on empowering each other to collaboratively tell interesting and satisfying stories, regardless of whether the characters themselves are successful. Um, and so pre-negotiation of scenes, for example, helps people have a mutually satisfying outcome. So it's an early form of consent negotiations, basically, at the table uh, and calibration, uh, as we call it now. So people were discussing uh, narratively where they would like their characters to go and agreeing before they'd even act out the scene. So instead of the dice determining what happens or somebody you know, pulling a secret out, there's this transparency that becomes emphasized, and then also this negotiation. And Fiasco um, has pre-negotiation, as we will see. Now, eventually, because of debates on this forum, many members left the Forge and formed other communities. Um, for example, there's the Story Games Forum, there's the Sin Aesthetics blog by Moira Turkington, and there's also uh, Google Plus, which became sort of the go-to place for the indie design community. This is very sad because there are many, many years of discourse of Google Plus, but then Google discontinued it. So all of that, a lot of it is gone. Um, now that is a contrast to what we see happening in the LARP scene where places like uh, Knutfunkt um, still have archives of a lot of the discourse that was taking place uh, because they published books. So there's a lot in tabletop, uh, the tabletop discourse that is either hard to find because it's buried in forums or is no longer available. Um, but this group became known collectively as the story games diaspora, meaning they're populated in lots of different places. And um, for example, different discords nowadays may host these kinds of conversations, but there isn't a central location anymore. All right. So let's talk a little bit about game design in Fiasco. 
So Fiasco by Jason Morningstar, uh, who uh, is part of Bully Pulpit Games, created this game. Uh, it's a game of powerful ambition and poor impulse control. Um, so it's inspired by cinematic tales of small time capers gone disastrously wrong. And these are the quotes uh, that are meant to prime you for how to play this game. Uh, and the, the example given were Coen brother films, which if you've ever seen them tend to be about small time criminals that you know basically unravel at the scenes uh, based on their capers. It's designed to be a one shot comedic game rather than a long-term campaign. So uh, traditional tabletop games come in all forms. Some are quite serious, some are quite amusing, but Fiasco definitely has a comedic air to it. Um, it's a game in which characters' actions tend to fail horribly due to their hubris, their greed, or simply their ineptitude. Uh, it uses dice, but mainly only to convey randomized bits of story. And I'll show you how that works in a second. Dice are also used to establish how badly characters ultimately fail, uh, which I will also explain. It subverts expectations of traditional role-playing games in several important ways, which we will unpack. And there are hundreds of settings called playsets uh, for Fiasco. These are not only designed by Jason Morningstar, but also other members of the larger community. So there's this encouraging of people to create their own playsets rather than saying what is part of the canon and what isn't and being protective of the IP of Fiasco. Anyone is welcome to create a playset, and they're often actually featured on the Bully Pulpit website. So you can find many on there if you are interested with lots of different themes and settings. So Fiasco is broken up into five parts. Like I said, it's a one shot. So it has one narrative arc that um, you can play within three to four hours. This, the first phase is the setup. And in this phase, the players collaboratively uh, establish their character relationships and other fictional aspects of the setting. So like I said, there's this pre-negotiation that's occurring even from the very beginning. In act one, each pair of players um, with relationships play out scenes. So if, I'm, if I have players to my left and players to my right, if we're all sitting in a circle, then my character has relationships with the characters uh, to the left and the characters to the right, and we will play out scenes with each other. Uh, in the middle of the game, there's a, a narrative turn called the tilt, and this has mechanics associated with it. The players decide what will go horribly wrong next, and they choose specific themes that are then, they are then encouraged to integrate into their scenes. Then we start act two, where each pair of players with relationships, again, play out scenes with each other. And then there is this phase called the aftermath. The dice will randomly determine the general fate of the characters, and the players will narrate their characters' epilogue. So they get to choose ultimately what happens, even if um, the, the dice choose how badly uh, their lives end up. The goal of Fiasco is to tell an interesting story, like we mentioned before. In this case, where characters make big plans in folly, and these uh, plans unravel over the course of the game. So players should not get too attached to these characters or to any outcomes. So during the setup, players roll a large amount of black and white D6s, um, and I'll show you what those look like in a second. They then choose aspects of the fiction based upon the numbers of these rolls which are assigned to the following details in the playset. So they're either character relationships, and there are charts for all these things between the characters sitting to the left and the right, or there are needs, locations, and objects. And these are narrative bits that will then get worked into the fiction during your scenes. So here's an example from the Main Street playset, which is in the main uh, fiasco book. Uh, of creating a relationship between characters. So all of this is happening before play even starts. On their turns, player one will have a default character relationship with player two to their right. Let's say player one names their character Jade and player two names their character Opal. On player one's turn, they then choose a need between Jade and Opal. And the way they do that is after all of these 
massive amounts of dice have been ro rolled, they select a black D6 that happens to have a one on it. And then they check the chart. And in this chart under needs, if you select a one, then that means your need between you is to get out of what we don't know yet, but to get out. So the two characters now have that mutual need. And then player two on their turn, they choose a white D6 with a six on it. Notice these are different colors, but it doesn't matter yet. The two characters now have a mutual need. And that mutual need is if you look at number six is to get out of a crushing debt that's coming due. So maybe they both, these characters both borrowed a lot of money from another character. The two characters will collaboratively improvise the details of the relationship and establish that before they actually start playing the scenes. So it's very much discouraged in these games to push any plot onto other people that they're not comfortable with or to take away any narrative agency from them. And this is a little bit different from traditional role playing games where there's a strong uh, amount of power uh, in the, the game master to control the way things uh, unfold. In Fiasco, there is no game master. Um, and also players can actually uh, attack each other or, to, or, or in some other way overpower each other if, they, if the rules allow it. But in this game, that's very much discouraged. Uh, instead, collaborative storytelling is the norm. So how Fiasco subverts traditional role-playing games. So it feeds the player's enjoyment of rolling a lot of dice which a lot of us have that enjoyment, but the meaning of the dice is different. They do not act as conflict resolution mechanics. And in the beginning and during the tilt, the numbers instead relate to equally interesting bits of story that players can choose depending on their interests at the time. And this limits their options while inspiring creativity. If we have too much open world, then it can be very difficult to, to agree upon a creative direction. So this gives us little options. Of course, if the players around the table agree, they can throw out that rule and, and bring in content that they want instead, that's fine. But it, it often helps stimulate creativity to have these restrictions actually. And during play, the numbers actually lose all significance. So they, all they were there for is to help you determine the story and players will award each other one black or one white die in the middle of a scene. And this, this is not to try to like get back at the character or the player or anything like that. This is just, you know, as the scene is unfolding, maybe it's going very well for that character and they get a white die and maybe it's not going very well at all and they get a black die. And of course, in a traditional role-playing game, you wouldn't want to have the black die uh, because that would probably mean that something bad might happen to your character. But in this game, uh, it's un unclear actually what that black die means until the end. And we'll go into that in a second. So at the end of the game, the players will roll the dice that they have been given and the black dice will be deducted from the white dice. So if they have all white, then maybe they're getting a high score in white, or maybe not. Maybe they roll snake eyes and they have a low score in white. But either way, um, depending on which is bigger, white or black, um, that will determine the fate of the character. So the total amount is then compared with the chart, which tells them what happened to their character. Now, a high number of either black or white can actually have a positive outcome. So this is where it's subverting expectations because negative doesn't actually necessarily mean negative here. So for example, if someone rolls a, between a 10 or a 12 in white, uh, it might be not too shabby. You've made it out with your dignity intact through some fluke. There might even be a little profit or self-respect or something. Time to throw a little party for all of your friends. Uh, these positive outcomes are actually quite uncommon on the chart though. Um, and then if there's a zero, uh, maybe they didn't get any points or they, they canceled each other out, the worst thing in the universe. This possibly doesn't include death since death would be far, way better than whatever this is. Be creative and don't settle for the worst thing that comes to mind. There's something darker, more awful, more wretched in there somewhere. Now, this is encouraging players to lose and to really uh, enjoy and lean into playing to lose. 
So other ways that Fiasco subverts traditional RPGs, it breaks with the serial nature of a campaign play, meaning a, a series of different games that happen that are all connected by the same story. Instead, it provides a short and hopefully satisfying play experience by its tightly structured play, which has a directed narrative progression that we just walked through. Uh, it also creates a social contract around playing to lose or playing for whatever is narratively interesting in the moment. It diminishes the need for the character to succeed as failure is quote unquote, the point of the scenario. So it encourages players to drive the game and the characters like a stolen car. And I love this phrase. Um, I have to remind myself of this sometimes when I'm role playing because sometimes the most interesting things happen when you don't uh, feel too attached to the character. So this, this philosophy reduces the fear around escalating the plot and allows characters and players the freedom, or sorry, players the freedom to abandon the characters at the end of the game. So there's not a lot of attachment to these characters. It also creates an experience that's centered around the mutual enjoyment of the players rather than fulfilling character goals. So again, players pre-negotiate and agree upon the scenes. It's often in a humorous tone, which can actually help players relax and build mutual trust with one another. Um, and each, because each character is given at least two relationships and therefore will play three scenes each, everyone roughly gets the same amount of spotlight time, meaning time that the spotlight is on their character uh, and they are role-playing. And that means roughly amount of the same attention from other players. And this cuts down on any one player or character being the quote unquote star of the game or hogging the spotlight as the game is structured to curtail that. Uh, the emphasis is on collaborative storytelling to the mutual benefit of everyone involved, which cuts down on players focusing solely on their character's goals and getting their needs met to the detriment of the play experience of others. All right, so as, as we talked about before, Fiasco was hugely influential and still is to this day. There've been a ton of play sets that have been created. I myself have, you know, collaboratively with my friends made at least two or three. Um, and the, another incredibly influential game that has spawned a lot of other games um, is Apocalypse World by D. Vincent Baker and Megway Baker. Um, Apocalypse World, brings back those success and failure dice that we have in Dungeons and Dragons and Vampire and other traditional role-playing games, but the mechanics are very much stripped down. The players or the characters are given moves which emphasize the telling again of an interesting story. So the focus is on the collaborative creativity of the group with the game master who is here called the master of ceremonies is directing the flow of the story based on the character's actions. So there is a, a, a storyteller here, a, an MC, uh, and they are responding to what the players want to do and what the characters are, are doing. Rather than creating a huge meta plot that the players will navigate through, the MC is being responsive to what, what, is, what is happening at the table. To the extent that Apocalypse World actually doesn't have established lore for how the apocalypse happened. Instead, you collaboratively create that at the beginning of the game as a group. So there's a focus on survival and relationships with a strong sense of lethality in this world for all characters. Um, like I said, um, this has spurred a lot of creativity. Uh, there's an online source game engine, which is they call the Powered by the Apocalypse game engine, where the, the way the mechanics are set up, which I'll explain in a second, anybody can take and reskin and, and, and change based on whatever they want to create. So hundreds of games have been designed based on this foundation. Some of the notable ones are Dungeon World by Sage Latora and Adam Cobal. Dungeon World um, is basically Dungeons and Dragons, but in Apocalypse World style and with a lot of the, as we call the um, serial numbers filed off, meaning that the IP isn't clearly Dungeons and Dragons. Um, there's also Monster Heart and Dream Askew by Avery Alder. Uh, Monster Heart Hearts is sort of in some ways a love letter to vampire, but also to the vampire diaries and to Twilight and to Buffy and all of these teenage vampire narratives. Um, and then Dream Askew is a post-apocalyptic, similar to Apocalypse World, 
but it focuses on a queer enclave that's actually been rejected from the main society and has to figure out a way to build community and to thrive together. So some design moves in Apocalypse World. Each player chooses a unique skin for their character. Um, and they have these evocative titles and, and, and visuals that go with them. So there's the battle babe, there's the brainer, there's the chopper, there's the angel, and there's beautiful, beautiful art that goes along with this. So um, we're gonna go over today a little bit about the angel skin, just so that you can see an example of what I'm talking about. What's interesting about this skin is that there should only be one of each in, in the game. So there should only be one angel at any given group of, um, of Apocalypse World. And what this does is it makes sure that your character is unique and cool in their special ways. They have their own special moves and abilities and they get to shine narratively at their particular moment. So this still feeds that desire to play in a campaign style, style uh, potentially to do really cool things with your character and have character goals um, while also making space for the creativity of other people. So instead of dexterity and intelligence and strength and all of that, the character stats are simplified. Uh, characters only have cool, which is doing something under fire, hard, which is going aggro, suckering someone or doing battle, hot, which is whether you can seduce or manipulate someone, sharp, which is um, reading a situation or a person, and weird, which is opening your brain to something unique to Apocalypse World called the psychic maelstrom. So this is the version of magic in this game, but unlike magic in Dungeons and Dragons, where there's very specific rules, instead you're basically opening up to this chaotic uh, whirlwind that the players are going to, um, and the MC as well, are going to determine what it does as you're doing that. Um, but you know, the weird score allows uh, any character to potentially tap into this psychic maelstrom. So these, these moves, uh, these stats are, are evocative and they promote story development, not just abilities themselves. So um, there are a lot of ways, like we saw with Fiasco, where there are limited creative choices. And that actually makes it a little bit easier for new players to engage and for people to create a character quite quickly. So for example, um, the character name choice is deliberately limited uh, to set the tone for the game. Uh, of course, you can choose your own name if you want, but you know, here we have names like Doc, Core, Wheels, Buzz, Key. Some of them may look a little bit gendered, but for the most part, they tend to, there are, ten, there are a few that tend to be highly gendered names, which means that people can play all different kinds of genders in this game. So built into the game is the uh, value that people should be able to play whatever gender they want in a game, which is, I would say, is significant. So in terms of stats, if you look here, um, instead of like rolling a bunch of dice and figuring out what stats you're, you're gonna get and spending all of this time in character creation, you just circle one of these sets. So if you wanna, if you know your character wants to do a lot of things that require, you know, for example, tapping into the maelstrom, you might wanna choose the weird plus one, which narrows all the rest of them down. And this makes it very, very easy to just quickly create a character on the fly. The gear, you don't have to look through a bunch of lists. It's all sort of listed for you. And then you get to choose one weapon. So there's a, there's a, a short little list here. And this is in contrast to games like Dungeons and Dragons that have page upon page upon page of different weapons and ranges and things like that to choose from. The leveling system is quite simplified. So um, whenever you have an improvement, um, you, you will mark the experience circle. And then whenever you have five experience circles marked, then you get to choose a new um, option. And then up here we have the look. So like I said, um, it, it encourages multiple gender expressions. Some of the looks that you can choose are man, woman, ambiguous, transgressing, or concealed gender. 
And this it, it encourages, again, uh, multiple gender expressions through the explicit design of the game. And we'll see that mirrored in games like Monster Hearts and Dream Askew and, and some of the out outgrowths of Apocalypse World. And then you kind of decide what you know, your character's wearing, what kind of face they have, their eyes, their body, and you're literally just circling things and moving on. Characters have minimal moves, and these moves are designed to evoke story. Part of the reason for this, again, is to be more accessible, but also to avoid people having to keep track of a lot of information. And a lot of um, moves or, or game mechanics uh, are kind of cumbersome. They don't necessarily add to story. So instead, there have been very few selected, and you get to pick two from them. Um, and then you also have these default uh, ones that are noticed here. And then there's this system called HX, which is basically uh, relationships, this system. And this is something that is, I think, quite interesting in terms of uh, the apocalypse world narratives in that there's an emphasis on relationships. There's an emphasis on interacting with each other in play and maintaining relationships. So backstory construction is actually woven into character design and there's these leading questions that are being asked. So for example, for which one of you do I, which one of you do I figure is doomed to self-destruction? So the angel is sort of this healer ar archetype and specific to their character is this question of which one of you am I really worried is going to end up self-destructing? because that's of, of interest to that particular character. So these evocative questions help create ties. And then again, people will narratively decide uh, why that's true, under which conditions that's true, where they can just reject that piece of fiction if they really don't want that to be true. Maybe it's a misunderstanding that that person has about them. Okay, so here's uh, a little bit more from the actual skin. Uh, so here's the angel. I'm not going to go into too much description here, but there's this evocative um, post-apocalyptic gritty, gritty description here. Um, so when you're lying in the dust of apocalypse world, guts are spilled for whom do you pray? So this kind of gets you thinking about what this character might be experiencing in their daily lives. And then here we have only six options for different moves. Uh, and again, these are designed for story interactions and they get to choose two character creations and they gain more if they level with this character. So there's the sixth sense, which we'll go over in a second. Um, there's professional compassion. So these are, these are skills that are quite interesting story-wise. Another thing that is quite unique, and unfortunately you might not be able to see it here, but each character has uh, their own sex moves. So this is an adult game for sure. It's not really meant for children necessarily. And um, sex moves are unique to each character and it will actually explain uh, what each character is, is capable of doing. Uh, in this case, uh, the healer, the, the angel, will give part of their hit points to someone else when they have sex with them in order to heal them. Uh, which makes sense because that's their archetype. And so this gives insight into the way that it, the character not only interacts in intimacy, but also just in general with the world. So mechanics in Apocalypse World, I'm gonna go over a couple of examples. So in second edition, um, you can determine if a threat is present by reading a situation. Remember we talked about that specific sharp skill. So all players declare their action. There's no rolling for initiative. The, the MC or master of ceremonies decides on the order based upon whatever logical sequence makes sense to them. So this isn't about trying to get to the top. It's about just everybody deciding what's happening and then the MC decides what happens. And combat is meant to be very short and quick and done. So there isn't a whole bunch of rolling dice. There's maybe one really important roll where you know, things happen. So when, a, when, a, when the character is ready to do their turn, they have, let's say, a sharp of one, and the action has a difficulty of seven. 
the players will always roll 2d6. So they don't have to figure out which die, which shape die, how many die, it's always 2d6 for all rolls. And then they add that roll to their stat, meaning to that extra point that, you know, or, or, or lack of point in that category. So in this case, it would be two six-sided dice, 2d6 plus one. So if the player rolls, like you see here, uh, well, actually, let's say a nine and a, a six, yeah, so a six and a three for nine, then they add one, and then they have a 10. So everything six or less is a miss. So misses are accompanied by an interesting story moment rather than just failure. And this is really important because sometimes missing is great. Sometimes way cooler things happen when you miss. And again, this is that playing to lose that is sort of embedded in the design. Um, however, there's still an incentive to succeed as well. If you have a weak success with a seven or a nine, uh, you may also have some other narrative events happen that complicate the scene that are actually way more interesting than if you would have just default succeeded. And then if you have a 10 plus, you have a strong success, which leads to additional interesting story moments as well. So let's say with a 10, the player not only notices that one person in the group is poised for violence, and they can even spot the exact type of gun that that person is carrying, and they can see who that person is eyeing to shoot at first. So it's not just, yes, this person is dangerous, but also the, here are some details about that that I learned because I got such a great success. So again, uh, just 2d6 for everything. This is for a specific um, skin uh, ability or move called Sixth Sense. Open your brain to the world's often chaotic psychic maelstrom to gather information. So in this case, the character has a sharp score of one and the action has a difficulty of seven. So as an angel, uh, their special ability is to roll sharp instead of weird in order to tune into the psychic maelstrom. They roll two six-sided uh, dies or dice, and then they add their stat. So in this case, 2d6 plus one again. It, but in this case, they roll two twos. So four plus one, which equals five. So that is not a success. Since everything six or less is a miss, uh, then there's an interesting story that occurs as a result of that failure. In this case, the character does not succeed in finding the information needed in the maelstrom that they were looking for. Instead, the character is drawn into the memories of a young child at the moment of the apocalypse that they somehow have access to now. And they experience his horror as the sky turned orange. So that's a really cool story moment, potentially, for the player. That wouldn't have happened if they hadn't failed. So how Apocalypse World subverts traditional role-playing games. As I mentioned, the MC is encouraged to guide players to do awesome things while providing challenges for them. So they act more like a cheerleader than an adversary. In this case, any main plot is far less important than a player generated creative uh, expression. It includes aspects that players consider fun about traditional role-playing games, like having exciting genres, stats, moves, and character sheets but it limits player choices to make the experience more thematically coherent. It is tightly built for story in the same kind of way that Fiasco is, and it makes character creation far easier. Everything you need to create a character is right there on that sheet for the skin, rather than in many, many uh, pages in a rule book. It does include combat and that lethality that some people find exciting, but it reduces the number of dice and modifiers um, to a predictable and simplified pattern. So you always know exactly what you're rolling and maybe you just have to refer to your character sheet to see exactly what your modifier is. This makes combat rounds very quick and very uncomplicated because we wanna actually get to the interactions, not just the combat. It reduces the numbers of skills, abilities, and spells a player must learn, and therefore reduces the cognitive load on the player. So it's not so overwhelming to try to keep track of all of this information. The actions always tell an interesting story, whether there's a failure, partial success, or success. 
Um, as I said, it includes mechanics for sex and relationships that have story-based consequences. So therefore it's foregrounding relationship building and the maintaining of relationship and that these become important parts of the game moving forward. And it also simplifies the leveling process. So these choices can remove barriers to entry for players who may be intimidated by large rule sets, including newcomers. They essentialize the core parts of RPG design that are fun and that veteran players really like, that they find recognizing and appealing, but it shifts the focus from winning and tactics to collaborative storytelling. It allows for quote unquote hacks of the game for free, which has produced hundreds of new games, often by new or less experienced game designers. These designers then become part of the vibrant and diverse indie community, which has its own audiences, sometimes overlapping with traditional role-playing games. And many, many more, <laughs> meaning there are lots and lots of different games out there. Um, for example, there's Ribbon Drive by Avery Alger, where the only mechanic is creating a playlist and a song changing on the playlist, and maybe the tone of the scene changes as a result. So some, some story games don't have hardly any mechanics at all. Um, but the idea is to, to really create really interesting, um, small contained experiences. So this is a lot of information, but um, I just wanted to kind of go over what has happened since the forge days remember people would go and they photocopy out their their uh, games and people who are in the know might go and, and get their game now we have crowdfunding and specifically we have kickstarter so indie and small press projects are becoming increasingly financially lucrative here are some figures from Kickstarter and different games. So Avatar Legends, the role-playing game, had 81,000 backers and it ple they pledged $9 million. Now this game had a $50,000 goal to start. This is an immense success for this particular game. And um, often with these Kickstarters, there will be add-ons that if people reach a certain stretch goal, then there will be um, new designers that are brought onto the team in order to create content. So this is also definitely like a collaborative mode of engagement. Now, Kickstarters for White Wolf games are also huge. So Kickstarter is being used in a lot of different ways, but I think it's especially helpful for indie designers who don't have a corporation behind them to fund what they do. So Wander Home by Jay Dragon, uh, $306,000. Dialect, um, a game about language and how it dies. Uh, this had 189,000. Apocalypse World Second Edition, Bluebeard's Bride, Xeno Language, Monster Hearts 2, Fall of Magic, A Field Guide to Memory, Thousand Year Old Vampire, a role-playing game, Rosenstrasse, uh, Wait for Me and Warbirds. Now I'm not going to go into the backstory of all of these, but I do recommend just taking a look at Kickstarter and kind of looking at the campaigns and the way that these games are presented because they're all quite different. And you can also see what the the um, the communication that the the authors have given to their funders. So there's definitely a direct relationship between the funders and the community, which is quite interesting. So the point here is not to necessarily judge one game over another, although it is notable that the only game on here <laughs> that did extremely well is a game that's based on another existing IP, and we will talk about that in a second. Um, but rather to give you a sense of the vast diversity uh, and, and the way that people are be, being able to make this a financial viable business model for them. So this, these numbers might not look like much, except for maybe Avatar, compared to video games, Dungeons and Dragons, or World of Darkness sales. Um, however, considering these indie design, designers used to release their games for free, it makes a huge difference in the quality of life of the designer, the professionalism of projects, bringing in new artists to join projects, and inspiring what we're experiencing as a renaissance of indie design today. And again, getting the official permission from a beloved IP like Avatar The Last Airbender makes a huge difference. Um, and some games will be shaped to be like that game, but not actually have the IP. 
indie games are becoming more well known, um, especially with key celebrities like Will Wheaton endorsing and promoting them. So a famous example of this, um, Geek and Sundry was a, a, a YouTube channel that was launched and um, he created a show called Tabletop where they actually were playing board games and tabletop role playing games. And it was one of the first examples of one of these actual play um, sessions that were filmed and he played Fiasco on there. Uh, in 2012, which which made the game much more accessible for a lot of people who wouldn't have necessarily picked it up otherwise. The indie landscape is shifting rapidly right now to the point where it's a little bit difficult to even recognize for people who've been in this scene for a long time. There's all sorts of new technologies that are shifting the, the dynamics. Twitter is huge, um, Discord, there are many new publisher, publishers, and a lot of games are happening on itch.io. Uh, many indie game designers are being brought in to write for traditional role playing games like Dungeons and Dragons. And this is super interesting because the history of tabletop is now coming full circle. People that have initially may have broke from these traditional games and critique them are now being invited in to help renovate them in a lot of ways and evolve them. Uh, also, many indie game designers have been become creating LARPs, attending LARP conferences and conventions engaging in the LARP discourse, which is blurring the boundaries between these tra design traditions, which were um, often quite separate, even if they were influenced by each other. So it's, it's no longer so easy to say if someone is strictly a LARP designer or a tabletop designer. Oftentimes there's a lot of overlap here. Um, so similarly, key experimental LARP desire, designers like Johanna Peterson now write for White Wolf and other companies, which increases this cross-pollination. And this is really great because, um, you know, innovations that happen in one area are now being brought into other areas so that everybody can benefit from them, rather than staying in these siloed communities. So if you want to get involved in Indie Tabletop, many of these designers are part of a community who support and share one another's work. So these Kickstarters don't just happen. They happen because members of the community keep tabs on each other, share each other's work, support each other's work. And I just want to emphasize that connections really, really matter. So make them if you're interested in getting into this. You can attend conventions, you can participate in online conversations, and you can reach out to your favorite designers. So some takeaways. Indie tabletop role-playing game design is wildly diverse in terms of both the content and the creators. It arose from discourse communities that challenged norms around the default game design in traditional RPGs. It thrives within an active community of designers and players. And it has become increasingly viable to produce at a high quality due to crowdfunding. And finally, it's always evolving into new experimental forms. So here are some sources. And again, uh, my name is Sarah Lynn Bowman from the Department of Game Design at Uppsala University and the Transformative Play Initiative. I hope you enjoyed this video.